everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. My guest today is a very popular guest on Chef AJ Live, and I'm hoping she'll consider having a regular slot next year because when she comes on, there's so many questions that have been sent in in advance. So guys, Get on my mailing list at chefaj.com because every week we send you the schedule and all you have to do to ask a question is hit reply. Tell us which guest it's for because the chat, well, it disappears so quickly. We don't see it and, you know, it just gives you a priority. So membership has its privileges. It's not really membership. It's just subscribing for our newsletter. So my guest today is a double board certified dermatologist, also board certified in lifestyle medicine. She practices in New York and her name is Dr. Jessica Kratt. And she's also a certified life coach now. So if you need some of that, in addition to some of this, check her out. Please welcome her back to the show. It's so nice to see you again, as always. Chef AJ, this is my favorite show. So it's always an honor and so much fun to come back. Oh, it's so great. Cause I mean, you are like, a, you're like an encyclopedia. I mean, the, 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 you know, the skin is the largest organ in the body and you just know the answer to like just about everything from head to toe. Oh my gosh. Well, I, I honestly have to say that I am, I surprise myself with my, with how much, I guess I knew, I do know sometimes, um, in answering your audience's questions, but I think what's, mo- what's even more valuable, honestly, in a doctor is that I know what I don't know, and I'm willing to say that I don't know. And I think that that's why my patients can trust me because they know that I will say I don't know when I'm not sure. And they know that I will say no if they ask me to do something for them that I don't think would be a good idea for them. So I think the I don't knows and the knows are just as important. Yeah, absolutely. Got to know what you don't know. Well, you want to get right into the questions? Or you want to tell us what you've been up to since the last time you've been on? Well, first, before I get into what I've been up to, I actually wanted to say that I have your updated new 10th anniversary edition of Unprocessed. And you know, you did not know I was going to pull this out right now. I promise you, audience. Uh, I don't even know. I can't tell if it's forwards or backwards in the camera. But this book is so awesome. That it's so easy, simple, readable um, for people like me who are not chefs and really struggle to cook um, for myself. I just love it so much. So I just wanted to say thank you for putting out a new edition and it is beautiful and very simple. Well, thank you. Your check is in the mail. I appreciate that. I didn't know it was coming. I didn't know you bought one, but I do appreciate it. And we did try to make it simple because I cook simple and I eat simple. So I think that's what people need if they're going to stick with it. Yeah. So that's you. Um, Me, I had the most fun, I mean, possibly of my career doing my half day live workshop in March that was through uh, your ultimate weight loss bundle. And I look forward to getting an opportunity to do something like that again next year in the bundle. But I talked to my audience that day in March about putting together a group coaching program that will focus on lifestyle of it life coaching mindset tips and tricks to not only help us know what to do, but actually be able to start to make habit change, make our lives better so that we can get that glow from the inside out, not just by putting stuff on our skin, but living better, living healthier, fixing our relationship issues that aren't so smooth, fixing stuff at work, like learning techniques for all of that is really what helps us sleep well at night, reduce our stress, uh, reduce our wrinkle formation and get our glow from the inside out. So I'm still gonna be putting information out about the plans for that um, this month and planning to launch it in the fall. For anybody who's interested, you can contact me through all of my contact links that are all around or maybe Chef AJ can forward you to me if, if needed. That's all I wanted to just put out there because I know that we had, big plan starting in March. And then I got a little bit derailed, but back on track. Great. Thank you. Are there people that just don't get wrinkles? Is there a genetic component or how much of it is lifestyle? Because it seems like as you age, you're going to get some. Um, It's very genetic. I'll be honest. It's very genetic, but as we know, there are genetics, which are the actual 
molecules in our DNA, which are, is in every cell and tells the cell how to work. But there are also epigenetics and epigenetics are basically the signals that come from every everything else. Our physical environment, the air that we breathe, um, sun exposure, our uh, emotional environment that's inside our minds and our bodies, what we eat, how we sleep, and our, how we exercise, all of those factors play into deciding which DNA signals get turned on and turned off. And that is really much more directly in control of what happens to our skin and our health throughout our, our lifetimes than just the DNA setup itself. We have the DNA setup, but the epigenetics really runs the show. So it's kind of like the old saying, genetics loads the gun, lifestyle pulls the trigger. That's a, that's right. a much more succinct way to say what I was just saying. Yes, absolutely. absolutely. Because you always wonder when you see people like, especially celebrities that look perfect, you wonder like, did they have something done? Like, can you tell when, when people had something done? Are you, are you able to ascertain when people have had work done? Um, sometimes I can tell, I'll, I'll say that one of the secrets is if people look like they have work done, usually I like to think it's not really the best work. If it, if it's really obvious, it's not my favorite style. I think that sometimes when you can tell someone's had it done, it's because it's been done badly or they have been given bad guidance. Um, some of the people who seem to be just ageless and the most naturally beautiful are doing some things, but it's just very low subtle, key. like a, like subtle, subtle, and you know I think appropriate and more elegant. But those those celebrities also really can often afford personal chefs and trainers, and they really take good care of themselves because it's they're paid to look good for a long time. It's their job, but it, it's also controlled by lifestyle diet as for the longest, the longest, um, track we can have with healthy behaviors, the better, the more impact we can have on our aging. If we start in our twenties, we have more of an impact on what happens than if we start later, but it's never too late. Yeah. But, but is it ever too late? Like, like, you know, a lot of people that are lifelong smokers, you know, how they have those lines, like, is it too late when somebody has smoked for a long time to reverse that damage? You know, what happens with lungs? I remember when there was a, a huge quitting smoking um, campaign for a couple of decades, and they used to show evidence that when people stopped smoking, it took about five, 10, 15 years, and their lungs would start to repair themselves. I believe that our bodies are always trying to be healthy and repair ourselves if we give it the tools to do that and take away the poisons and the bad influences. So I'm sure that once some damage is set in in the skin after a certain age, it's too late for it to completely reverse itself and completely go back to looking like we were 20 and never went in the sun. But it definitely slows down the damage and it allows repair to begin. And then if we try to do techniques to improve that, we have a better chance than in somebody who's continuing bad habits. You know, staying out of the sun these past four years has been my circuit. My, my skin has never looked better. And it's because, you know, when I moved to the desert, the dermatologist who was also a plastic, plastic surgeon read me the riot act. He said, this is not LA sun. Like, you know, cause they treat skin cancer all the time. And so I, you know, I wear sunscreen every day, even if it's cloudy, I wear sunglasses and I wear a hat and I've been doing that for four years. And, you know, I, of course I have wrinkles and things, but my skin is like, it's gotten better. From staying right. out of the sun, really, that's the biggest change I made. Like, I don't let the sun touch it. I don't care if it gets on my arms or my trunk, but I don't let sun touch my face, not on purpose anyway. Right. And I've seen your hot pink hat with the face covering. So I, I believe you. I know it's true. And I also grew up in South Florida and people don't believe that I grew up going to the beach constantly, lying by the pool. It was my mission in life to get tan be as tan as possible and have no tan lines. And as soon as I started training in dermatology, that just ended. And my skin, my sun damage, you know, did start to reverse. And now people don't believe that I was, I was ever, you know, in the sun so much. Yeah. 
you know, it's, it's, I, I look at some pictures of me, even on this channel. I'm like, Oh my God, why didn't anybody tell me? I mean, it was so dark. I mean, that not, that's not normal. I, there's something addictive about the sun though, that, I mean, it just feels good to be in the sun. Well, not only does it feel good to our skin, I I'm sure that in an evolutionary way, we are attracted to being in the sun to some degree, because contrary to what I was trained to believe and what most dermatologists teach. Um, I do now see modern science and I, and I'm starting to believe that there are, there are health benefits to actually getting some ultraviolet radiation on our skin. Uh, I, I think we have to balance it with not wanting to get skin cancer and not wanting to look wrinkled and age ourselves, but I'm not somebody who says, don't get a single ray of sun on you. And I'm not somebody who believes that a vitamin D supplement can replace everything that our body gets when that ultraviolet radiation um, hits our skin. It actually triggers some, some activation of our immune systems or, or deactivation, a balance in our immune system. And there's evidence that in latitudes um, on, the, on the globe, uh, farther away from the equator we are, in higher latitudes, um, the higher the incidence of some autoimmune diseases and closer to the equator where there's more UV radiation, there may be increase in other health issues, health conditions, but the incidence of some of these autoimmune conditions actually goes down and they're starting to equate that to uh, UV exposure. So I think there's more to look into there. And uh, the other thing I was going to say about the sun being addictive, and it's something to really watch out for, is that it actually is, um, we, we take in the sunlight through our eyes and in our retinas, there are receptors that control circadian rhythm and also are linked to neurotransmitters that control mood and endorphins. And it actually is a little bit neurochemically addictive to be in the sun. So people who are used to tanning all the time, tanning, 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 who are told to not do that anymore, stop going to tanning beds and stopping in the sun all the time, feel a little depressed. And it actually is a real, it's a real phenomenon. So it's something to watch out for and something to not let yourself become addicted to in that sense, because it, we want to balance. Yeah, great. Thanks. Well, I'm going to hop into the questions if you don't mind. And the first one is from Wanda. What is Dr. Krantz's take on using liquid collagen supplements for your face? I'm guessing they're not vegan. Right? Right. True collagen is not vegan, first of all. And um, we know that because collagen is only found in animals. So there are vegan collagen-like supplements that contain some, a lot of, um, molecules that help boost collagen in humans when we ingest those supplements, but they don't actually contain the collagen, which is com comes from animals. But in terms of liquid collagen for the skin, I'm wondering if she means to put on the skin. And from what I understand there, that has no actual benefit. It doesn't, the collagen does not get into your skin and actually do anything biological. So I don't think it has much value. Great. Thank you. Will lemon peel applied to age spots help reverse the color? Lemon juice is vitamin, has vitamin C and vitamin C is an antioxidant and in safe um, applications and in products that are formulated safely and in a stable way, it can help to reverse and prevent some sun damage and may help to lighten spots that already exist, depending on what caused the spots. Lemon peel has oil in the peel. And as far as I know, that oil is potentially actually gets triggered by sunlight to cause phytophotodermatitis in some people. You can actually get a burn, darkening of the skin and even a blistering burn. If you have citrus oil or even mango skin oil on your skin when you go in the sun. So I would not use the oil of a lemon peel 
to try to lighten spots. But if you want to try some dilute lemon juice carefully, so you don't burn your skin, that might be more in the correct direction. Thank you. But I mean, th there's things that dermatologists can give you too, like certain creams and potions, right? That help on age spots. Yeah. Vi you know, vitamin C is in a lot of formulations because it really does help the skin and it's formulated more safely. Um, but I know everybody likes to try to be natural. So yeah, absolutely. Everyone's, everyone's making their home concoctions. I just can't tell you that it's safe to put lemon juice directly on spots. You might actually burn yourself. Yeah. Also, okay. Well, we live in an unnatural world, so it's hard to be natural anymore, right? Oh, at least completely. So here's a question from Elizabeth. Is it important to cover up so much all day? I heard it important to let the sun in for vitamin D and serotonin. As a great question, because it just piggybacks on what I was talking at length about a minute ago. This The ultraviolet radiation from the sun causes skin cancer and it causes sun damage and wrinkling and aging, but it also does probably trigger healthful benefits um, in our bodies. One of them is the creation of vitamin D and um, in the serotonin, the, the mood question, it may, actually may not be serotonin. We're, we're just still learning about which neurotransmitters really relate to mood and depression, which are which go, which correlate, which show up in the test versus what's causing it, what's causing depression or what's causing it to get better are, are now being questioned again, because everyone's been assuming that low serotonin causes depression, but it might just be something that is a marker that is associated with depression and not necessarily the cause. So I don't want to answer this too specifically because I don't think we know yet, but the sunlight, um, the ultraviolet radiation on our skin has health benefits. The blue light, blue visible wavelength, not the invisible ultraviolet wavelength, but the visible blue wavelength in sunlight, like the blue color of the sky actually is helpful. And it has specialized receptors in our retinas that help to trigger signals to our circadian rhythm and having a healthy circadian rhythm is very tied into having uh, healthy, manageable moods and helping to relieve depression. That's why, especially in, in high latitudes where there's a lot of darkness, but also in people with seasonal affective disorder, which is a seasonal depression, doctors recommend a blue wavelength light panel to shine toward our eyes every morning to help relieve that tendency to depression. Great. Thank you. So we had some questions sent in. This one is from, can't tell which is the first name or the last name. So I'm not going to say the name at all. I know that Dr. Krant will be a guest and I want you to know, I want you to ask her whether or not there are natural ways to treat hair loss condition besides using toxic medication that I've been advised to take, which I refused. The condition is called central centrifugal cicatricial alopecia, CCCA. I oh. was diagnosed two years ago during the pandemic. A biopsy of my scalp was done to confirm the diagnosis. Thank you. Chef AJ, you did a masterful job reading that. Well, you know why? I was the, I was the voice actor for The Pleasure Trap and boy, there were a lot of hard words. <laughs> oh, good good for you. That's a, That sounds like a fun job. You probably learned so much. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Central centrifugal cicatricial alopecia, CCCA, means central in the middle of the head. Uh, centrifugal, meaning kind of circular and central. And cicatricial, meaning scarring. Alopecia, meaning hair loss. So that is, if it's truly cicatricial and scarred, there is no possibility to reverse the scarring and the loss of the hair follicles. That CCCA condition is really an end stage condition, I'm sorry to say. What we try to do in that case is slow down and reverse the damage happening to the hair follicles on the border, on the edge of that, that aren't completely scarred and gone yet. 
I don't know which toxic medications your doctor recommended, but one of the treatments that we do is localized uh, temporary injections of a corticosteroid, uh, like a cortisone. That is a natural molecule that's also in our bodies. And it does block the autoimmune attack on the hair follicles that's been triggered by inflammation. So sometimes the, the local injection of the cortisone is really, really valuable and it's temporary and it's something I wouldn't necessarily refuse. I can understand not wanting to take oral medications, but in terms of natural things that may help support hair growth, one that I have actually studied in my integrative dermatology learning, which I'm still working on, is that is pumpkin seed oil. Pumpkin seed oil is actually proven to help hair grow. So in the lieu of putting it on our scalps, I might even recommend eating pump, raw, um, unsalted pumpkin seeds every day that may help to support hair growth. Great. Thank you. Never heard of that condition. Lots of acronyms. Okay. This is from Tammy. What can I do to get rid of blackheads on my nose and especially long time blackheads that are in the crease of my nose? Maybe you can talk about blackheads because I've heard there's blackheads and there's whiteheads. What's the difference other than the color? Not only will I talk about blackheads and whiteheads, but I will also say that what a lot of us have been educated by the media and by marketers to think of as blackheads are not actually blackheads. That's the most important thing I want to say first. And I say this to my patients all the time in the office, little tiny black dots on our nose that are flat are not blackheads. Those are actually natural pores that are always larger toward our, on our nose, the center of our cheeks, kind of this little T, the classic T zone. If anybody remembers acne TV ads from the eighties, they used to say the T zone and that T zone is an area of our, of our faces that naturally has a little bit more response to testosterone and male hormones. We call them androgens that tends to make oil glands more robust and pores a little bit larger. And what sits in those pores is called sebum. That is the natural health promoting oil that, that moisturizes our skin and actually the more of it we have, the less we are likely to get wrinkly as we age. So those larger pores there um, help, help cells heal and help keep the skin young. But the tip of the pore being open to the air and that oil, sebum, greasy oil sitting in the pore, which is natural, when it touches the air, the room air, um, it oxidizes like tarnishes and it turns dark like like tarnish on silver. So that little black dot that you see is actually the tip of the natural sebum plug. And it's just turning dark because it's getting oxidized. We can gently try to remove those with pore strips, with salicylic acid and things like that. But if our skin is healthy, it will refill those pores with sebum and eventually the dots will reappear. The more we squeeze them and manipulate them, the more inflamed they get and the more they may scar and actually look appear larger. So I just don't want everyone to think that if you have black dots on you, there's something wrong. A lot of the story that that's bad and needs to be treated comes from acne product marketing and TV ads. So just pay attention to that. True blackheads though are actually clogged pores and we call those those are called open comedones or comedos. Those are real pimples. The open ones have that little tip that's open and it's oxidized, but it's a it's clogged up and raised up in a bump and it's plugged. A closed comedone is a whitehead. And that's just the same thing, but the pore is sealed and that little plug has not been exposed to the air and become black and oxidized. So blackheads and whiteheads are non-inflammatory types of pimples. There are four or five types of pimples. The blackheads and the whiteheads are the open and closed comedones, non-inflammatory, but may, be bene may benefit from a little bit of gentle exfoliating, unclogging those pores, maybe a little bit of a vitamin A derivative retinoid or the plant-based alternative 
bakuchiol can help to unclog those. Inflammatory pimples and, and what we people sometimes call blemishes, inflammatory pimples are red. They are either red bumps that we call papules and they're small or they're red bumps with a white tip and that's called a pustule. Then the fifth type of pimple is the deep under the surface painful ball that's a little bit larger. And that's what we call an acne cyst. So open comedones, closed comedones, papules, pustules, and acne cysts are five common types of pimples. Wow. How much does diet play a role? Because are you familiar with Nina and Randa Nelson who wrote the clear skin diet? They were not able to clear up their acne until they went not just oil-free, but low fat. So could some of what people eating be creating some of these things on their face that they don't like? I think one of the most valuable things I teach my patients these days, since especially since knowing you, Chef AJ, but I just started to really learn about it before meeting you a few months before is how much of a diet does play a role in acne. The number one category of food linked to acne in about five different ways is dairy. So first thing I tell my patients when they want a natural way to improve their skin and reduce breakouts, especially teenagers is cutting out dairy. And some of my patients have been able to completely clear up their skin by stopping the pizza, you know, cheese, ice cream, and uh, milk, lattes, all the dairy they didn't realize that they were taking in on a daily basis. Stop cooking food in butter. Um, so dairy is inflammatory. Dairy is hormonal. The, the dairy proteins, casein and whey, directly trigger growth factors that create increased oiliness and skin clogging. So reducing all of those factors really helps acne settle down, but correct Nina and Randa, I do know of them. Uh, we haven't crossed paths in person yet, but I know we will soon. They are amazing. Um, if just cutting out dairy alone does not cut it, I then, I don't want to scare my patients too quickly. So then I go down the road and I say, let's take out inflammatory foods and I try to reduce reduce meat and reduce junk food to junk food to zero, get everybody on whole food and really no processed food. And then taking away the, taking away oils, don't cook with oil. And then finally uh, minimizing even plant-based foods that have fats. If somebody's really <clears throat> still has stubborn acne at that point, there may be other medications that we want to add in or other lifestyle considerations. I always very carefully go over with my patients exactly what their actual routine is at home and what they're actually doing. Because a lot of times people have habits that they don't realize are exacerbating their skin's inflammation while they believe that they are actually trying to get it to be cleaned out or clear it up. They're irritating it. They're drying it out. They're being too rough with it. And that actually keeps everything going, possibly even using too much medication, which can continue to keep it flared up. So there's, there's always so many factors, but diet is my favorite to bring up. Uh, thank you. This is from Heidi. What does Dr. Krant think about PRP, platelet-rich plasma, microneedling for facial wrinkles and for growing hair? And what about charcoal facials, fibroblasts, and deep heat radiofrequency? I don't know any of the things she's mentioned. Okay. That's, I might be too much for me to answer all here all together. So just pick I, one of them. Maybe gonna, the first one is PRP. That is um, platelet-rich plasma. Plasma, yep. PRP, the concept of PRP is that instead of just um, introducing growth factors on the surface or injuring the skin and trying to trigger wound healing of the skin naturally in a controlled way, the concept of PRP is that we injure the skin in a controlled way and introduce growth factors from our own blood 
deep under the skin where it may uh, have more direct effect. I, there is a lot of evidence that it helps people. I'm personally still on the fence over how long lasting the effect is and also whether it's the injected growth factors that are making the big difference or whether it's the controlled injury of the skin, which is like microneedling by itself create triggers wound healing, which brings those growth factors to our skin anyway. So I'm still, I'm a, I'm a slow adopter and I'm still on the fence waiting to see what the true long-term outcome is. I've seen people have great results from scalp PRP for hair growth, but I've also heard that it only works in a few cases. And after you stop the treatments, it may actually revert. So I'm still waiting. <laughs> The jury is not in. Okay. All right. Let's go to the next question. And if we have time, maybe we can answer some of the other things she mentioned that I've not heard of. And this is from Karen. I have tried everything to strengthen my nails. Any suggestions for nails that split and break? I've used nail formulas that are supposed to strengthen biotin, skin, hair, and nail supplements in keeping the nails file to no avail. What is the best skincare products for women over 65 who have combination skin? So there's two questions there. Well, maybe the nail one first. You know, I found what helped me is just getting manicures. They make them so strong. Um, right. Nails are tricky, just like hair. Nail strength and nail stability is highly genetic. So some people are just born with nails that tend to be thinner, tend to be more peely. And some people are born with these beautiful, hard nails in the perfect shape that look like fake manicures. So it depends where you are on that spectrum, what you're starting out with. But that said, um, biotin has not really been proven to grow and strengthen nails. So that's, that was very popular for a while, but I think it's sort of becoming known that not only is biotin not technically helpful, but bio taking a biotin supplement can really mess up testing for thyroid issues and also um, testing when you, if you think you might've had a heart attack and you go to the emergency room and you're somebody who's been taking biotin, it actually messes up the testing for them to try to determine whether you had a heart attack or not. So I'm very cautious. I, I don't necessarily promote biotin supplements unless your own, your own physician tells you to take biotin because you're biotin deficient after they've tested you. Um, Nails. So nails, nails are, are difficult to grow. One of the things I have actually found to be helpful is horsetail extract. It's one of the only things that I have believe that I've actually seen an improvement in the strength of nails and reduction of peeliness. So that is one thing that I would believe may help you. And the other is to just make sure that you have supremely strict nail hygiene. These nails cannot go into water. They cannot go into soap. They cannot do dishes. They cannot clean. No quickly grabbing a sponge and washing a couple of dishes unless your, nail, unless your hands are in big rubber gloves. And cuticles are the doorway to the root of the nail, the matrix where the nail is being formed. So if your cuticles are dry or if you get your cuticles clipped off at the nail salon, or if there's too much trauma to the matrix area of the nail, like manicures are too rough. It will damage your nail as it's trying to form before it's even come out onto your fingertip. So nails out of excess water and soap, highly moisturizing, greased up even every night when you go to sleep and just don't be too rough in the manicuring. Wow. Thanks. Oh, and she wanted to know uh, what was the best skincare for women 65 and up uh, for uh, combination skin. Combination skin. I don't really have a way to answer that. That's, I say, start gentle, start mild. Um, I don't have one skincare line that I promote at this time. So maybe ask your own dermatologist what would be best for your skin. I do believe that we all have combination skin. Let me just say that. I think that the whole, is your skin oily? Is it dry? Is it combination? It's another one of those sort of marketing created myths. Um, 
but some people believe they have combination skin because they are oily, but also flaky. And that might actually be a medical condition called seborrheic dermatitis, which is actually a, a technical term for the same thing that causes dandruff on our scalp. I've seen, no pun intended, a rash of increase in seborrheic dermatitis lately. And I have my theories on why that might be. But if you feel like you're getting dry, but also oily in these areas, you're dry, you put moisturizer, it doesn't work. That might be seborrheic dermatitis and something to talk with your dermatologist about. Okay. Thank you. Do you think you'll ever develop your own skincare or makeup line? Oh, one can dream. You know, I think a, a, a real skincare line that is truly novel and not labeling some, you know, generically available formulas is a very big investment in of money and time. And there are so many at Sephora who's, who would be interested in little old me. So, no, you know, vegan, whole food, plant-based, this, you know, board certified. I don't know. You never know. Well, you'll, you'll be like the second to know after me, Chef AJ, if I think <laughs> I might try it, I'll come to you for your advice. I would definitely promote it and use it. Krant Cosmetics, who knows what it'll be called. Let's, we'll, we'll think of the name first and then we'll think about what the product is. <laughs> okay. Lattered, lattered. I'm actually, the branding is, is so much fun for me. I love yeah, thinking That's about more it. fun than actually creating the product. <laughs> All right. This is from Jocelyn. Is vitiligo reversible with a healthy diet or a raw diet, such as the protocol followed by Dr. Goldner? And how do you stop it from spreading? Do we need to reduce sun exposure? Vitiligo is not, vitiligo is an autoimmune, that's your own immune system, attacking the pigment cells that are in your own skin from the inside. So getting white, getting patches of depigmented skin. And this is, this is a common condition in people of any skin tone. It's just very visible in people with darker skin, but it happens to everybody. For it, we don't really know what causes it. What We don't really know what triggers that autoimmune attack. It is not caused by sun exposure. There are white spots caused by sun, but that is not vitiligo. That's not an autoimmune condition. That is just prob possibly, I'm not looking at you or any of you, but if you have spots that will no longer tan, that is caused by chronic sun exposure and, and just cells that have given up and just don't want to tan anymore. I do. I even have some myself. My arms are, I, I don't know if you, you can Oh, see. there you go. Yeah. There you go. And you know what I don't like is this old person mark that I have here. You know, I get those like the old people when I used to be a respiratory therapist in the hospital, the old, you know, the old person bruise. Yeah. That's called an actinic or senile purpura. That's which a is terrible name. Why can't they have more favorable names like aging gracefully spot or something? That's a great idea. So oh. actually I'm going to derail and just answer that one for a moment. Um, and then go back to vitiligo because there, a lot of people have those little bruises and they say, Dr. Crant, I don't, I didn't hit my arm or bump my into anything. And I just looked down and actually it's a little scary to see it. Sometimes people worry it's something dangerous. What that is, is a spontaneous little crumbling of the microscopic capillary in your skin that normally is a little tiny, tiny, tiny blood vessel. But after decades of sun exposure, those, I mean, this is not going to be very flattering either, um, but it's a great image. Our, our blood vessels in our skin and, and all of our collagen too, and our elastin, it gets, it goes from being rubbery and stretchy, like a rubber band to being a little bit like an old rubber band, kind of dried out and crumbly. So one day that little capillary just crumbles a little bit and the blood leaks out into our skin. And that's where those bruises come from. It's not even that we're doing anything. Keeping the skin robust um, and juicy and rubbery and out of the sun can help to stave that off. Back to vitiligo. Um, Vitiligo is an autoimmune condition like other autoimmune conditions. And there are so many. I, I don't know that we know that there's a dietary treatment for it, but for sure, anti-inflammatory, whole food, plant-based diet, stress management, getting good sleep, 
and all of those other things we know reduce inflammation will give it the best support possible from the inside out. We wanna turn our immune systems down to healthy levels and stop the attack on our own cells. But I can't say that diet alone would be able to cure it. What can we do to stop it spreading? Really that and see a dermatologist for help from the outside, either with creams or special kind of lasers. Great, thanks. All right, here's one. Uh, Linda says, does anything work for rosacea? Rosacea, unfortunately, is a term that's like a one word term for about nine different skin conditions along this spectrum. A lot of people mean redness of the face. It can be everything from broken blood vessels, from chronic flaring up that becomes sort of more permanent as those vessels become more permanently expanded in the skin. And that's, and no bumps and no itching, no flushing, but just those broken blood vessels sitting there all the way to bumpy, itchy, inflammatory papules that look like a form of acne, but it's not like classic acne. And it's very central in the face. All that whole range is all considered rosacea, even to that classic rhinophyma, which is the really bumpy and large nose that we don't see as much in society anymore, but used to be really common. People would always associate it with somebody being an alcoholic. Yeah, but I think about W.C. Fields, didn't he have like a red nose a lot? Exactly. W.C. Fields is a classic example. He may have triggered all of that from a lifetime of heavy drinking, but it's possible that he really had just had true rosacea and it didn't come from alcohol at all. It just so happens that alcohol is a trigger for rosacea. So alcohol, spicy foods, and everybody, heat, um, sun, everybody has their own personal favorite rosacea triggers. And the way to treat rosacea is to avoid the triggers, which can be dietary, which can be environmental. And also re to remember that a lot of rosacea is an invisible inflammation and loss of the healthy barrier in the skin. So a lot of times people feel like they don't want to put on a moisturizer because they don't want to clog up their skin and they want to dry it out and dry it out. But that actually can flare rosacea and make it worse and worse. We want to actually calm the skin, be gentle with it and protect it with moisturizers and sunscreens to help to heal the barrier. So the skin's own anti-inflammatory processes can take effect when the skin is broken and the barrier is damaged. We lose our moisture and we are unable to heal our own skin. So we always have to just make sure that barrier is protected so that our skin can do its best healing itself. Thanks. This is from, I just saw it. It was about, oh, here it is from Cindy. How can you prevent sebaceous hyperplasia? Maybe you should say what it is first and then tell us how to prevent it second. Sebaceous hyperplasia is, sebaceous is the, the adjective describing those oil glands. Sebaceous skin is, the, is kind of an old fashioned term for um, skin that has a lot of enlarged oil glands or larger oil glands, oilier skin, larger pores, but everybody has sebaceous glands. There's a sebaceous gland attached to every single pore and every single hair follicle. And that's where we get that healthy skin sebum. Sebum comes from sebaceous. So those sebaceous glands moisturize our skin and actually are the source of our healing. When we get an injury, we don't want them gone. But as we get older over time, sometimes those sebaceous glands are triggered to continue to grow beyond where they originally should be growing and they can form little bumps. They can look kind of pinkish orange, um, vaguely pinkish orange. And they're very common on the forehead, sometimes around the temple areas as we get older, sometimes around the mouth area. I think the original question was what can be done to prevent them? I don't know other than lifestyle options that reduce inflammation. 
and keep the skin calm and operating in a healthy way, such as possibly keeping diet, uh, dairy out of the diet. It, it may actually help to reduce triggers on those sebaceous glands overgrowing because it actually helps us our, keep our hormone balance better. Um, treating the skin gently and not trying too hard to keep oil out of it because that can trigger a rebound effect of the oil glands trying to compensate. And potentially a whole food plant-based diet might might help reduce them. I just don't think we have proof of that yet, but they are frustrating. And the only way we can treat them once they're there is physically zapping them and burning them a little bit to getting them to smooth down and trying to kill the root um, very gently in the dermatologist office. There's no way to use a cream that will make them go away. That said, it's possible. Let me just put a caveat there. Retino retinoids, the vitamin A derivative which are over-the-counter retinol, prescription tretinoin, possibly the plant-based alternative bacuchiol, though I don't know if we have proof of it yet. Um, they help to regulate the oil glands and um, regulate the, how the skin cells develop and grow. Maybe a retinoid may help slow down the development of the sebaceous hyperplasia. I don't know if we have proof of that yet for sure. The, the, when you say retinols and trent, trent, I can never say that name, are they the same product, but just the prescription one has more of it? No, retinol and tretinoin are different molecules. Um, but under the surface of the skin, one converts into the other, and it actually has a direct impact on your, on the nucleus of your cell of your cells. So we're, we're it's kind of in that gray area of do these cosmeceutical products actually go into your skin and do something. Um, on the one hand, we want them to, because we want to know that our skincare is working. And if it doesn't go into your skin and do something to yourself, it's not actually doing anything. Um, on the other hand, these companies don't want to prove necessarily that their cosmeceuticals are actually going in under the surface and doing something to ourselves because the products that go under the surface and do something to our cells are considered by the FDA to be drugs because they actually affect the function of our skin and not just the appearance. And anything that affects the function is considered a drug and needs to be not only evaluated by the FDA, but will be regulated by the FDA. And these cosmeceutical companies do not want to be regulated by the FDA. So they're always on this, um, balance beam of trying to claim that they really do something without actually saying they actually do something. And that, if that's why you're confused about whether they actually go into your skin and do something, that's why. Great. Thank you, ma'am. So here's a question from Libby. My partner has been washing their face with Dr. Bronner's liquid soap twice a day for years, which makes me cringe. It doesn't seem to damage their skin, but could it be doing damage? Before I answer that, I want to add one more PPS to the last question, which is to say that tretinoin, the prescription cream, is a drug that it has been tested, has submitted testing, and is regulated by the FDA. That's why it's prescription, and it has been proven to go under the skin and help fight wrinkles. It's the only FDA proven and FDA approved anti-wrinkle cream. Uh, retinol is its cousin and that's over the counter and did not go through FDA testing, but tretinoin, the prescription one did, they both work. I will tell you, they really do both work. Okay. But that, so tretinoin, tre I never can say, why can they make it an easier pronouncing name, but that really helps wrinkles. So, so like when, the, when you have these things out of your eyes, those aren't wrinkles, those are crow's feet. They're different, right? Oh, good question. And I haven't forgotten about the Dr. Bronner's question, but they are wrinkles. The, if you get lines here and then when you stop smiling, the lines are still there. Those are wrinkles. Um, the formal scientific term for wrinkles is rytids or rytides, R-H-Y-T-I-D. Um, there are two types of wrinkles. There are two types of rytids or rit rytides. 
There are dynamic wrinkles, which are formed from facial expressions. So if you smile and you create a fold and it, the fold is only happening where you're creating that expression, that's a dynamic wrinkle that's happening because of the facial movement. Um, then there are wrinkles that form if you look at an older person's cheek and in the middle of the cheek where they are not making expression, there's a lot of little wrinkles that look like kind of a desert floor. Like if you look at a picture of somebody much older who has a lot of sun damage, very, very wrinkly in the middle of the cheek there, those are called static wrinkles or static rightids. And those are not formed by expressions. Those are not lines of expression. Those are from chronic sun damage thickening the surface of the skin while breaking down the collagen and the elastin underneath that usually give it a, its juiciness and its glow. So there are two types of wrinkles. The retinoids help both, but they can't completely stop you trying to form the dynamic wrinkles because you're still gonna make facial, facial expressions what reduces the wrinkles forming from facial expressions are the neuromodulators like, like Botox, like Dysport, like Xeomin, like Juvo, and some of the other ones that are coming toward America and some places they already are in other places in the world. Those weaken the muscles under there so you can't fold the skin and that's all they do. Those can't be good. You know, I've asked Dr. Lyle about it because I, I I mean, part of me would love to do it, you know, but I'm so, I mean, if I, if I have to go to a pedodontist till I'm 50, you think I'm going to be getting needles in my face, but he just doesn't think they're safe. And he's heard of people that have been damaged by those treatments permanently. Well, first of all, I, abs I know that a lot of people are delivering these treatments out in the world now who have a wide variety of credentials and experience. So I can only say that board certified dermatologists are actually trained in the science of the skin, both on the surface and underneath. And we also have a lot of surgical training. So we have a real understanding of the biology of the skin and what's physically under there in terms of anatomy. True neuromodulators that are made for cosmetic use in people are medical grade and they are just a little piece of a molecule that's a toxin that is broken off and put in put in as a little dry powder into these vials. Um, if a small amount is used appropriately in the appropriate level of the skin in the appropriate location, it's it temporarily cleaves the receptor between the signal of the nerve and the muscle. So there just is no signal between the nerve and the muscle and the muscle stays relaxed but that muscle built, rebuilds its own receptors over the next three months. So nothing permanently bad has happened. That said, if somebody puts too much in or puts it in the wrong place, puts it in the wrong level, puts it in the wrong muscle, um, there can be temporary to longer term side effects and potential real danger. If somebody's, for example, trying to treat the neck and puts too much, it's possible that some of the toxin molecules could get back toward the swallowing muscles or something like that. So it is a real medication. It is a medication. It is not a cosmetic cream. It's not an anti-wrinkle cream. It's an injected medication that should only be done by appropriately trained people. You know, I remember when I used to live in LA, sometimes I'd have catering jobs and it seemed like all the women went to the same plastic surgeon because they all kind of looked like this, <laughs> you know what? And I'm not kidding. Like they're, they're, they're like, they're, it just like their lips would be like really big and their face would be really tight. And it was almost like there was no expression, like, like nothing moved anymore. Well, you know, that's a culture. And that's a little bit about what I was referring to earlier saying, like, if you can tell somebody had something done to me, that's not, it's not my preference. I don't want to say it's bad work, but to me, I'd rather people look like a version of their younger natural selves and not look like they're trying to look like a different creature, dare I say. Um, but I do think that people get forget what they look like and they get used to a different look and then they forget that they look like that and they you know, start to become uh, immune to the changes and how they look. And it's up to the doctor to say, 
I think you're good for here. Like, let's wait six months before we do anything else. Let things wear off. Let's wait till next year. You're great. And give little pep talks because otherwise people come every three months and keep doing stuff and it ends up creeping along and ending up being too much. Yeah. Wow. Dr. Bronner. So I am, I am not somebody who believes that soap is evil and that cleansing your skin with a gentle soap or detergent is evil. Um, removing that outer layer of oil gently for some people is healthy and valuable. Uh, It's also that process is a little bit of a mild exfoliating. If you massage your skin and for some people, it helps their skin stay more clear for other people whose skin is more sensitive over cleaning is, is too much cleaning. So I think it's really individual, just like washing our hair, by the way, there's a huge culture, cultural push now to tell people not to wash their hair. That shampoo is dangerous. And I think that is a little bit made up and that everybody's scalp and hair health is a little bit individual and what works for you and keeps you feeling (laughs) healthy and keeping your hair looking good is pretty much fine. Great. Thank you. Here's a question from a live viewer. Is there, are there any home devices at home devices like new face, Omnilux, et cetera, that work for anti-aging? There may be some technology that really does work. Um, I don't know of brands or specific devices. I do know that they're getting created for home use after they may possibly had some evidence in controlled office use. And generally the office devices are stronger because they're usually hopefully done by a doctor, but at least by hopefully somebody with some healthcare training and they should be regulated. The ones you can buy on the internet, please be careful because sometimes they come from other countries that don't have the same regulation as the United States in terms of safety. And when you're buying from Amazon, you don't know where it's coming from. So I can say the answer to that is it's possible that some may really do something, but I don't know which ones to tell you. Great, thank you. Uh, There's a question from Diana. Are essential oils good for facial care? And if so, which ones? I am not an essential oil expert. And I used to be completely against them and not believe them at all. But I've softened my stance on that to say that in my integrative dermatology training, I, I have come across some concepts that lead me to believe that in certain formulas, even aromatherapy actually does affect our health and um, that some essential oils really do have health benefits, but I don't know them well enough to answer that. Thank you for saying what you don't know. A lot of people were saying they will buy Krant Cosmetics once it's created. Oh, thanks guys. I'm, that's really um, motivating and exciting. Maybe have a big K and spell cosmetics with a K, you know, be a little bit different. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. Okay. I'll I'll consult with you. Thank you. Uh, Paul wants to know what causes itchy scalp? Itchy scalp can be caused by everything from literally a pinched nerve from a disc in your neck, making your scalp itch in the back. It really could be neurological um, all the way to uh, stress and anxiety And if we reduce the anxiety, actually the scalp itch goes away all the way to allergic reactions to products that are getting put on your scalp, Um, possibly seborrheic dermatitis, which is that medical term for dandruff, which I believe is increasing lately. And now I will reveal that I believe it's increasing because everybody's using sulfate free hair products. And I think that with this trend of sulfate free and SLS free um, hair products, which some in the media are pushing as healthier and safer, I believe that those products are not as good at keeping our scalp clean and free of pterosporum yeast because they are so gentle that they're not taking care of this yeast the way traditional shampoos do. And the way traditional um, schedule of shampooing like a few times a week used to take care of. Now the media is telling people 
don't wash your hair so much, like once or twice a week or twice a month to let it be healthier and um, use only SLS free hair products. Everybody's coming to me with itchy scalps. So when that, when my patient, I mean like 10 patients a day. So when that comes up in my office, this is the first conversation we have. And I've even cured my own dermatology colleagues of severely miserable itchy scalps by having them go back to the shampoos that they used to use before they were told to stop using sulfates. The toxin conversation is a whole other conversation that I don't have proof of or time to talk to you about right now, but I just want to throw out there that we may be causing our own itchy scalps. Interesting. All right. Here is a question from Karen. Can cellulite be reversed? Can I tell you my story about it? And Wait. maybe you can tell me if this is uh, normal. So, uh, you know, it's been over 10 years since I lost these 50 pounds and kept them off. And so after I lost the 50 pounds, I, I don't even think I can get up and show it to you on both sides of my thighs. It was like cottage cheese, like indentations and, you know, just, you know, not real attractive, like not comfortable wearing a bathing suit. And now that it's been 10 years and I've stayed on the same diet, meaning pretty much no fat. I mean, I eat the fat is in the food. Like I don't add nuts, seeds and avocado. It's gone away. I've done nothing other than just not eat fat. And that's why I believe what Dr. McDougall says, the fat you eat is the fat you wear because it's gone now. It's like, there's none there. There's no divots. That's amazing. I hope that that would work for everybody. Um, I do believe that cellulite is very hormonal and inflammatory. So, you know, women, um, we we tend to, uh, you know, 90% of women have cellulite. It's very normal and natural, but it may be that reducing inflammatory foods in the diet, cutting out dairy, cutting out oils and anything that triggers inflammation and excessive fats may help to reduce the inflammation and let those fat cells shrink back down so they're not pushing against the sinews and the fibers that are trying to keep that little network of fibers that they push through that get all lumpy. And also when we eat an anti-inflammatory diet, our skin quality improves and the surface skin actually maintains a little more thickness and support and elasticity, which also helps to smooth out that area. So I do believe that healthy diet and lifestyle can be factors. Great. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Uh, Lee says, is rose oil good for the skin? I don't remember, but it's possible. I, I have to, I would have to look that one up specifically. It does sound familiar, but I can't remember right off the top of my head if there's proof. Okay. And Elizabeth says, how good is coconut oil for moisturizing the body and not the face? It does get absorbed though a little bit because Dr. McDougall was talking about how when somebody, they, they couldn't be fed, they, they put the, the fat you put on the skin, actually some of it gets absorbed. I do think excessive use of coconut oil has been shown to potentially raise LDL cholesterol. So I think it's, uh, Dr. Dr. Michael Greger says that it's okay to put on the skin of an adult as a moisturizer, but not a baby because babies have a much higher uh, surface area to volume ratio. So too much goes into a baby's system if you put it on their skin, but for an adult, we're much larger. So our, we, our systems can tolerate it a little bit better in terms of risk to LDL. Agree, do not put it on your face because it is comedogenic and will cause a terrible type of bumpiness. that's like a weird acne. You will not be able to figure it out. Like similarly, don't use it on your scalp because that scalp oil does come down onto the face and affect the face skin too. Perfect, thanks. Uh, but um, Hepzibah wants to know if you know anything about the halo treatment. I, if she means the halo H A L O laser, it is a laser system. It actually has a lot of different options. It's, it's considered a fractionated laser in that in the eighties, we used to laser people's skin for resurfacing and we would burn the whole skin layer off 
and there was a very high risk of scarring, permanent scarring and infections. And um, it's really hard to manage it well. Some people still do it in extreme cases, but it really, you really have to go to somebody very experienced and very, very serious and focused on how they're going to take care of you. Fractionated lasering for rejuvenation is much safer, but still is a true laser that can burn you and permanently scar you. It creates a little grid of injuries, a uh, micro thermal zones of injury and leaves skin intact in between the dots to help those injuries heal. Um, Halo is a respected product, but you would definitely have to see your own doctor to find out what the parameters would be and find out what experience they really have with it. Cause it's, it can be dangerous in the wrong hands. Thank you. Anything could be dangerous in the wrong hands, right? <laughs> right. And especially lasers because they are like truly like weapons that we have now made into our anti-aging friends. So they are a re the real deal and should not be no pun intended taken lightly. Uh -huh. Why can't we just accept aging? Like some other cultures seem to accept it much better, like in the blue zones, for example, they don't seem well, to have plastic surgery. It's funny you bring that up because here as a board certified dermatologist who does medical and cosmetic dermatology in my office, including some of these procedures, I'm also a lifestyle medicine doctor. And really what I'm trying to put out there is how do we, uh, age are in our most healthy, best way, not constantly feeling bad about ourselves and feeling like there's something wrong we have to fix, but making ourselves the healthiest and youngest, most glowing and vital version from the inside out. And part of that is the cultural investigations around what are, what kind of anti-aging cultures have we created here, especially not only in this country, but especially here um, with this culture of, you know, multi-billion, billion, billion dollar culture of all these products and all these devices versus this is how humans age and let's be our health <laughs> as we do it and live our best lives and stop thinking about it. So I'm figuring it out. Great. And now the next question is about how we can make us not look as old. You, you sort of answered this, I think with the retin, but Kathy Ann says, are there things we can use on our face to help decrease wrinkles? I think number one, number one, number one, number one is do not let sun get on your face. Chef AJ is a perfect example. If we're not really persistently and reliably protecting against sun damage, all the other stuff that we do can't really uh, fix everything. So number one, everyday sunscreen on your face. And I really recommend neck also. And if you really want to get to it, do the chest too. So right here, this whole thing. Um, number two is a retinoid, a vitamin A derivative, the over-the-counter retinol, which is everywhere. Um, Bakuchiol, which is the plant-based alternative, which has been proven to have equal effect. Um, I think over, over time, we'll get even more and more data on that. And if you have a dermatologist, you could ask for a prescription for tretinoin, knowing that if you're using it for anti-aging, it is not considered covered by insurance. It's considered cosmetic and that's okay. You get a lot out of one tube. But when would they cover it for insurance? Like what reason would somebody be able to have insurance cover it? Cause it's like a hundred bucks, I think. It's a hundred bucks, but a tube lasts a good six months if you're using it. Right. So it's not as much as you think. Um, it's, it is also a um, FDA approved treatment for true acne. So if you really have acne vulgaris, which is common regular acne, um, many insurance companies will cover it. It is very hard for us to get it covered for people they believe are also using it for anti-wrinkle cream. They don't believe us when we say people have acne. Uh, um, it all is also useful in other conditions, but it's not necessarily easy for us to get insurance to cover it. It's helpful in psoriasis. It's helpful in um, just a long list of other of other skin conditions. There are about three thousand skin diseases. So these retinoids are really valuable um, tool in our armamentarium. But it I've never heard that word before. Armamentarium. armamentarium. Wow, he's smart. <laughs> they, they, uh, our tool, our tool, our weapon chest, our tool chest. Our 
our arsenal. Yes. They, uh, they, they do help fight wrinkles too. And I'm sorry to say, Chef AJ, I might have to go soon. Oh no, well, we, we, you can go. I'm just, hey, okay. I love talking to you. You can go whenever you want. But but just real quickly, will Trenton, I can never say that name, become less expensive maybe after the patent? Maybe is there a patent and then eventually there'll be a generic one of them? Tretinoin is the generic molecule. And it's still $100, wow. Well, supply, law of supply and demand. Um, the original brand that went out of patent and became the generic tretinoin was Retin-A. So if everybody remembers the original Retin-A, that was the real deal, original brand of tretinoin. I wanna respect your time. So of course you can go and please come back. We'd love to have you on as often as you would like to come on. There's just wonderful uh, comments in the chat. For example, Kathy says, Dr. Grant is delightful. I appreciate her sharing her knowledge in such a clear manner and her complexion is flawless, making it obvious she knows what she's talking about. Thank you so much, Chef AJ. And I just, I mean, I promise you, no, I'm hope I'm not embarrassing you. Nobody knew You're I was. Not, no, I, I appreciate the accolades. I did um, not read the book and and I, I I can't wait to see what you make. And maybe you'll post it on your Instagram, which is a great place for people to follow you. And how else would you like people to connect with you? Well, I think Instagram. And then for now, um, if you go to my website, which is artofdermatology.com, and at the bottom, get yourself added to the, the newsletter email list. That's all, those email addresses are going to get all of my information about upcoming programs and all of the educational stuff I'm going to put out about healthy lifestyle, dermatology tips, and also the mindset work, the healthy habit building and the life coaching and any programs that I'm going to do in that direction and eventually figure out how to put all this together in one under one umbrella and maybe have a skincare line and, you know, the whole empire will build from there. Great. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Cran. It was wonderful spending time with you. Great to see you and to catch up, Chef AJ. Thank you. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back at 1 p.m. when we kick off Food Addiction Recovery Week on Chef AJ Live with Dr. Robert.